Live from Boston, Massachusetts, extracting the signal from the noise, it's the Cube covering Red Hat Summit 2015. Brought to you by Red Hat. Now your hosts, Dave Vellante and Stu Miniman. Downtown Boston, Stu, back bay at the Red Hat Summit. Stu and I are really pleased to be at home for a change. Chris Wright is here as the chief technologist at Red Hat. Cube alum, just had Chris on at uh, OpenStack Summit. You guys are up there in Vancouver. Welcome back. Thank you. So, of course, different venue here. Uh, you guys obviously heavily involved in, in OpenStack. You're more than heavily involved yeah. uh, at this event. So, this is uh, our show. congratulations. It's really exciting. A lot of great discussion going on. What's your take on the event so far? Oh, it's great to see the, the familiar faces and the new people coming in to check out what we're, what we're up to. Uh, this time around, I think our, our, we have a lot of interesting things to talk about with our, some of our newer products and how we're bringing products together to create solutions for customers where you know, historically you look at a lot of the things we've done, we've invested in technologies, maybe it's a point solution. Here we're really working together with our customers to, to identify how we pull all of our technology pieces together and provide comprehensive solutions for their data so center. So, Chief Technologist, you were telling me off camera, your role is very broad, but you're also quite specific where you go deep. I, I suspect that you've probably forgotten more than, than I know on most of those broad <laughs> topics, but, but we, can, we can go deep. But talk about your role a little bit at Red Hat. Well, my role is to help uh, define our strategic technology vision. So we're working on understanding where technology intersects with our product roadmaps and our customer needs, and and really look forward. Where, where are we not? Where do we need to be going? What are the issues that our customers are grappling with today that we don't have great solutions for and, and where open source technologies are emerging and, and bubbling up to the surface as, as great uh, solutions to those problems. So dial back a little bit to, you know, I don't know, maybe you know, coming out of the downturn 2010, let's say five years ago. What was the conversation like? What were the trends that you were observing? I mean, obviously the proprietary versus open thing, that discussion you had, you know, a long, long time ago. But what was the what was the conversation like, just five years ago? The interesting thing about, especially because of the downturn, the downturn. The interesting thing about that time was very much about cost of ownership. So we came with a great feature-rich solution that was cost competitive with the proprietary solutions, and that that cost edge was really with the economic squeeze was something that for us helped push us along. It, it gave us a, a new toehold with, with different customers, and today the conversation is really shifting away from just that commoditization and total cost of ownership to how do you operationalize big complex systems? And you heard a little bit of that today and, uh, or yesterday in Jim's keynote about the, the change in open source technology from a commoditization play to a place where real innovation is happening. And that's what's so exciting about this event in particular, where we're starting to showcase the innovation in the open source world and how it, you know, how we can bring those to products. And so innovation at scale. Innovation at scale. Really, I mean, yeah. we talked, uh, Stu and I were, had the pleasure, we were at, in London with the, the guys at MIT talking about the second machine age and, and how you know, computers have always replaced, or, or machines have always replaced humans. Now computers are replacing humans in cognitive you know, functions and we start thinking about the infrastructure for that next generation. That, right. You know, we talk, always talk in cloud, mobile, you know, social, but so what does that infrastructure look like for the next generation of apps? How would you describe that? Well, for one thing, it's highly distributed. It's designed around scalability. Everybody wants to operate their systems at the same large web scale that, that the massive web companies are doing these days. And the to get to that uh, distributed, large scale system, you're, you're building a system that's expecting failure all the time. You're building systems that can route around the failure. They're redundant, localized, but it's, it's not this big, massive, huge redundant system that you have two of. You've got a large number of nodes. You're expecting things to change dynamically. You need to provision your systems uh, to, to adapt to the current use cases or, or you know, the ways that you're needed to allocate your resources are changing quickly, and that's that's quite a bit different. So when you talked about commoditization five years ago, uh, today we're talking about how quickly can you introduce new services into your into your data center. So that implies a lot of automation, uh, more than more than a lot. I mean, <laughs> a highly a highly automated environment. Are are enterprises, in your opinion, ready for for that to give up the knobs and the bells and the whistles and, and the control that they have physically? 
Well, I think it's a, a, a trade-off, right? So they have to see the benefit, and the benefit is how many IT people in your organization does it take to, to manage a, a number of servers? And when you start to see the multiplying effect of, of adding APIs and, and using programs, really, to, to operate your infrastructure, that's compelling. That really changes the, the discussion. And those, the CIOs are seeing the efficiency of, I used to have a, you know, 10 servers to admin ratio, and now I have a 100 or 1,000 servers to admin ratio. And that's hard to hard So to the idea with. of infrastructure as code, and John Furrier likes to talk about data as code, actually using the data to predict what's actually going to happen in the infrastructure. It's, it's awesome. It's, it's, yeah. it's, that's kind of an emerging trend, right. so it's not really well established in the industry, but you know, first we had to operationalize this complex system. So how do you automate the infrastructure? Uh, as the infrastructure grows, and we're always pulling analytics data out of the infrastructure, the next thing we need to do is, uh, I glibly call it automate your automation. It's, it's the learning stage of how do you actually, you know, a large scale infrastructure, you can't still programmatically interact with all of the components as there's faults. You need to have the system kind of pay attention to that and and potentially learn from what's happening within the... So self-learning systems do. Yeah. Yeah, so never been closer. So, so Chris, <laughs> I wonder if we, you know, dig down a, a, a level deeper. Uh, you know, we've we've seen the the Linux operational model and Linux specifically starting to spread throughout. You know, other parts of the operating system. You know, Red Hat has gone into some of the storage stack, uh, some of the right. networking stack. Uh, you've you've got companies in both of those spaces that are now. You know, we're talking about the software defined storage and networking and, and operational models. Can can you you know walk us through what what you've seen in that space the last couple of years? Well. Software defined is, is a big component. So uh, it's it's putting an API on something as so it's now available as a programmatically as a service. Uh, the the underpinnings of, of Linux as a mature technology and a consistent way to do your management is I think really critical here because now you have systems that despite whether they're providing compute, storage, or even networking, you have the same common building blocks. And so if you're using something like Puppet or Chef for configuration management, you can use that across all of your infrastructure as, as we really continue to grow these, these storage uh, and, and networking stacks outside of just the traditional compute side. So, one of the big challenges we've had, I mean, especially you look storage and networking, I mean, things move glacially slow. Uh, I, I know when I do my, my roadmaps and presentations talking about networking, I mean, I draw decades out there. I mean, just moving from a speed bump, uh, you know, from one gig to 10 gig, we've been doing it for over a decade and we've still got a lot of work to do there. Um, so, how do we move things forward? How do we push them? You know, people tend to, you know, deploy something and never change it and, you know, boy, not just changing the components, but changing the mindset and the people. We, we, we know that takes a lot of time too. Cultural shift is the is the really challenging side of this. So you talk about something like DevOps, you can you can discuss the tooling associated with DevOps, but it's the cultural shift in an organization to that makes it happen. That's the, the challenging part. Uh, it's the same same thing here with the networking. I think one of the key differences is historically we had uh, an industry that was focused on producing standards through a, a fairly long process and then providing multiple implementations of that same standard all from proprietary, uh, you know, preferably from a vendor's point of view, vertically integrated stacks. As we move to a more open world where we can uh, focus less on the standardization process and more on common code as a way to build a de facto standard, that helps us accelerate the process. And if we're building from common building blocks like Linux where we already know how to operationalize it, you know, we're giving ourselves a leg up to, to help move this the industry forward. Okay, so can, can you speak a little bit to, you know, I, I know NFE is an area we want to dig into this space, you know, uh, we said SDN, you know, a lot of the problem we had on SDN is it wasn't quite well defined. I think NFE has a little bit more of a definition, tends to be kind of the telco service providers, certain right. specific application focused uh, deployments as opposed to SDN was more kind of an operational model. Um, m maybe give us your take on what NFV is and, and where's Red Hat's play there? Well, first of all, the two are, are interestingly related. Okay. And, and in the beginning it was often confusing which is which, and NFV is really the, the service providers effort to take appliances, function specific hardware appliances and move that network functionality into software that you could run anywhere on a, on a commoditized compute storage network fabric in a cloud. SDN is a networking operational model as, yeah. as you described it. It allows you to, to steer traffic through some infrastructure and with NFE you've got 
historically boxes that are positioned in well-defined ways in your, in your data center, you can sort of cable your flows to a certain degree. Here you've got a very dynamic environment, your functions are moving around and, and being instantiated and, and uh, move, dropped quickly within your, your cloud environment and to steer traffic through that dynamic environment takes something that's highly automated. So there's the SDN controller component. For us, NFV is first and foremost a platform to, pr to run these new applications. So we're providing the infrastructure to, for this platform. It's OpenStack, it's Linux, it's KVM, it's all these low-level building blocks to create a runtime environment for these virtual network functions. Uh, and then it's also an SDN controller. We work with a variety of, of industry partners and then we're also focused on some upstream projects around the SDN space like Open Daylight. Okay, can, can you speak a little bit to the, I guess, the requirements? You think the enterprise I needed, you know, mission critical, I built it highly available. Um, when I move to a more distributed, you know, software-based world, I still need some of those things, but you know, I, I kind of feel like the, the hyperscale model is getting a little bit more enterprisey, and the enterprise is, you know, slowly moving along to get a little bit more distributed. You know, what's your viewpoint on that? Well, I think one of the key things to think about is, is if you're coming from a telco background, you're you're thinking in terms of five nines, six nines. It's about the availability of potentially a specific piece of hardware. As you scale out the system, you you have to change how you think about it. There's faults happening at all points in time somewhere in the system. You can't consider uh, a, a single system as a five nines or six nine system the same way we did historically. We need to look at service level availability. How available is the service? And that can be done through redundancy uh, of all the different compute nodes in the infrastructure, redundancy at the application level, and, and awareness of how to load balance and steer across a number of different instances of the same service in, in your network. Pretty, pretty big shift, and that's something that will require, uh, you know, the service providers to also change how they view their their definition of of reliability. There's also performance, critical performance characterizations that you have uh, when you're packet processing packets. It's not just about, um, uh, you know, in a cloud environment, packet processing looks like a web application. It looks like a few packets come in. You do some interesting work, some look up in a database, you send some packets back out. If your application's job is to process packets exclusively, very different workload, very different uh, pro performance profile on the, on the platform. And we're spending a lot of our time optimizing a, a stack like OpenStack to host packet processing applications in the most efficient way possible. So when we talk to practitioners in the telco industry about NFV, they're, they're maybe not as sanguine as some of the folks in the vendor community. We're talking about this off camera. Uh, and they, they'll say, you know, NFV's okay, but it really solves a hardware problem, kind of like virtualization sort of solved the hardware problem. I have a software management problem that NFV doesn't really attack, and we need to see more of you know, the roadmap sort of developed out. Is that, is that fair in, in, uh, uh, in terms of sort of the roadmap, the white space of NFV, or is there maybe a misunderstanding yeah, there? No, I think there's, that, there's, there's some fairness there, and, and the reason is the, the initial focus has been very much the low level there's an orchestration issue or an integration issue, and that's that's not as well addressed in the current uh, open source projects. So most of the focus has been at the very bottom. How do you provide virtualized infrastructure? As you go up the stack and you need uh, the ability to, to manage your, your various um, software components, orchestrate where they're placed, you've got multiple data centers. Uh, that's, you know, in the, in the NFV parlance, it's usually called Mano, and the Mano space is still more um, focused on, on vendor solutions and less on open source development efforts. So from a open source, how can you solve this problem? We're doing a great job at the platform level and we'll slowly move up the stack to help kind of uh, flush out the, the white space as you described it. But I think it's a fair assessment that that's a big challenge. Operationalizing this software environment, uh, you know, that's, that's, that's the next step. Hmm. So maybe talk about some of the things that as a technologist really excite you. Chris, I mean, what do you, when you look at all the innovations that are that are going on in mobile and cloud, and we're talking a lot about this whole new sort of programming model, the DevOps thing is clearly taking off. As you look out even further, what's exciting you? Well, first and foremost, what's excite, what excites me is, is Linux is ubiquitous, open source is the common development model, and one of the things I love about uh, DevOps is it takes what we've been doing in the open source world, which we call release early, release often, um, just to the next level. And it's about integration and how do you how do you actually take code to production as quickly as possible, where you want to recognize 
uh, your failures as quickly as you can so that you can revert them or, or roll forward through them and fix them. Similar, ish, similar kind of d mindset that we've developed in the open source development communities. So just the, no the sheer notion that Linux is ubiquitous and open source is the common development model is, is really exciting. And, it, and you see in there a lot of point technologies that are e emerging. So containers, awesome, really exciting technology, a ton of cool stuff going on there, a great level of enthusiasm in the industry around it. That's, that's fun to see. I'm sure that that's a trend that will continue. It's not just a point fad. It's something that's going to really impact how we do our uh, uh, build our data centers and, and deploy our applications. To me, it all is these different building blocks of distributed systems. And we're trying to make distributed systems uh, accessible to people managing data centers. And that means a lot. To so, I wonder if I could follow up on that, if, if you don't mind, ahead, Steve. Yeah. So, so the interesting thing about what you said and that answer is, a lot of that is cultural. And a lot of that culture came from the web scale and the hyperscale guys. And, and so you know, we always talk about how five, six, seven years ago they were doing sort of what the enterprise is doing now, so let's figure out what they're doing now and see. But that cultural shift, the whole DevOps mindset, is that a sort of permanent you know, transference of knowledge, if you will, that will lead the enterprise to actually more innovation? Or do you think we'll still see, I'm sure we'll see a lot of borrowing, but you know, will the enterprise close the gap with the web scale innovations is really my question. Well, that's a place where Red Hat really focuses on. So our, fo our customers are enterprise customers. We deploy a lot of applications with our customers in environments that don't look like the, the modern web scale environment. And you, so you hear the, the kind of Gartner uh, bimodal IT world where you're, you're, you're recognizing that these two different worlds exist at once. The question that you're asking is, do we get to a place where that mode two is just the steady state? And I think that's, it's, there's, a, there's a possibility that we have a cultural shift that supports that. There's always going to be a notion of more mature applications and more you know, rapidly evolving applications. But can we get to a space where we can consume both of those with the same kind of agile mindset, that I think is possible. Yeah, and the problem with bimodal IT, I mean, with you know, respect, due respect to my Gartner colleagues, is it's saying, create two stovepipes, right. old and new, which one do you want to be in? I mean, so I, I, to me, bimodal IT is not sustainable. It's yeah. what you described now is really the, we want to build the nirvana, towards, right? towards yeah. the cultural shift yeah. that, that supports innovation. So, um, you, you talked a little bit about, about containers, and, and there's two aspects that I was hoping you can comment on. One is just the speed at how fast things are changing. Uh, you know, we said, you know, OpenStack's releasing every six months. How do I keep up with that? Docker's releasing every two months, and you know, it's just going faster and faster. How do we keep up? And, and the thing that goes with that is, the problem in enterprises is a lot of times they deploy something, they don't want to upgrade it, especially networking. I mean, once I deploy that code and I get everything in good shape, right. you know, don't breathe on it because you know it won't break. But you, you described the new model is it needs to be dynamic and upgrading. You know, do you see a time where you know we're, we're just automatically upgrading and, and getting the new features? I mean, something like CoreOS talks about. Um, you know, yeah. what, what's your thoughts on kind of those no, two I, angles, I the speed and the upgrades? The, the it's a, it's a part of how we're innovating. So we're innovating by changing rapidly and the, one of the ways we can mitigate the risk associated with that is, is introduce those changes quickly so they're small incremental changes so that you can very directly see the impacts on, on your infrastructure. The challenge is you need to have the right testing capabilities to actually validate something that looks like a real world use case so that when you go to production you're, you have a high degree of confidence that you're not going to break, break the world. Uh, I do think we have the the tooling and the know-how to get to the point where we can do these kind of consistent upgrades, um, but you know, it's it's a it's a journey. We're not there. We're yeah. So I, 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 you know, we have so many discussions. You know, you know, open source is ubiquitous, and, and Linux is doing great. But if I have a proprietary model, it's easier for me to upgrade. You know, if I use an Apple device, I think it's like you know, 85% of Apple devices are on like the current version of code, or up to n minus two. If I look at Android, it's like 4% of people because there's just that interoperability problems. I know Red Hat solves some of that, but you know, maybe comment on how how, how do we move that that discussion forward. Well, the, the Apple versus Android one yeah. is interesting because there's a, there's a control thing where you have yeah. control of the hardware as well as the software. Yeah. So on the Apple side, there's 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 it's more it's not surprising that you have this sort of common rollout. In our world, we it, we map maybe more to the Android world where our customers are deploying on a, a wide variety of hardware. Um, they're picking up software at different points in our in the product cycle. 
So what we need to be able to do is, is help them get to the point where they can consume the changes as, as quickly as we can validate that, that they're stable and, and we're ready to support those. That's something that we learn together as a you know, supplier and a, and a customer. And that's a, a journey that we're on right now. And we're building the tools to deliver the, the changes as quickly as we can, as quickly as our customers can consume them. And I think it's a real challenge right now where uh, on the one hand, you've got tons of exciting innovation happening and the valley lights up with enthusiasm over the next thing, which we're still two things behind in the enterprise. So how do we get those great technologies into the enterprise? And that's something that we're really working hard to facilitate. So we understand where the technology is in its maturation curve and then how we can uh, find the sweet spot and deliver it, you know, deliver it to our customers and then update. Things that have been around for a while, we don't update as regularly. Things that are brand new, we have to update more rapidly, and that's just sort of practical reality. Yeah, I mean, so much of it. I think about the interoperability matrix of how stuff goes together and something Docker's trying to help, but, you know, I mean, Linux with, you've got the network effect of the community to be able to test the various pieces, you know, who maintains the various uh, pieces of it. You know, the enterprise, I said, if I, if I don't buy open source and I make some change, you know, I own it forever, as opposed to, right. you know, the value is if I can get it into the code and upstream and get other people participating, you know, at least there's some shared uh, responsibility there. Yeah. Huge, super important to get your code upstream. Upstream first is a critical mantra that we that we speak at Red Hat, which is ex addressing exactly what you're saying. The minute you make local modifications, you run the risk of of putting yourself on a permanent fork that you own and maintain, and you've lost the ability to leverage that external development community that was critical in building the infrastructure. That what do you see happening in organizations? Um, are going through this cultural shift. Actually, more importantly, maybe the parts of the organizations that aren't, uh, that old stovepipe that I talk about. What what are organizations doing? Are they doing enough to sort of train this new generation? I mean, the new generation, not so much. They're coming out of school with this mindset, but but the existing resource pool of, of developers, are, are they able to you know, pick up on this new culture? Are they, I mean, you guys provide a lot of training, I, I know. Uh, we're trying to get some folks on from Red Hat training, but. But what are you seeing in terms of the ability of the old dogs to learn new tricks? The, the ability is there, so we see that, which is great. If we didn't see that, we'd be really worried. Um, it is about, a, it, it, it's about this, this cultural shift means you're, you're trying to understand why would, I, why would I make this change? I've lived in a world where I've been risk averse and what's, what's happened is you continue to get more and more pressure for uh, new features from your line of business and potentially fewer and fewer resources. So at a certain point, you, you really have to adapt your model. And that's sort of the tipping point where we're seeing that's, that's, that's what's creating the, the momentum towards uh, being able to take a risk averse environment and turn it into a place where you're, you're willing to understand that introducing change does introduce risk, but that also brings value. And it's the value that's, that's the important part of the equation. So. You've kind of got, I mean, to really make it simple, you got, when you look at application types, you really got three, I mean, you could have zillions, but to simplify it, you got existing apps that are 15 to 20 years old that you want to get more agility out of, make them look more like new apps, leave them on, on, on premises. You got apps that you're going to develop in the cloud, and then you got existing apps that you want to move to the cloud. I mean, that's kind of what companies are doing. It, mm -hmm. it really boils down to those three. So is to buy that and how does Red Hat sort of fit into that, that pattern? Well, for the, for the app that you wrote 15 plus years ago, you're probably not touching it. So it's really about just keeping it running, uh, providing infrastructure around it, it, giving it compute storage networking so that you're, and maybe some oper op operational interfaces so that it's easy to turn it on, uh, you know, replicate it, turn it off, whatever you need to do within your data center. Maybe a coat of paint. Right, <laughs> okay. freshen it up a little. Um, the it's it's the the other two categories that you described, where we're building tools to help our customers build applications that are either directly, uh, you know, cloudware applications, and then you can deploy it on your own infrastructure. You can deploy it on a public cloud, um, or slowly build your uh, the the individual pieces of your application out of some of these sort of cloud services. So you don't necessarily have to take your whole application and rewrite it but you may be able to, to immediately use a storage layer instead of uh, writing directly to direct storage in, in, a, in, a, in uh, the current environment that you have. So 
how do you piecemeal, piecemeal bring your application to a newer, uh, more more cloud friendly uh, environment? Or if you're writing brand new applications, you're writing them from the from the ground up in a cloud aware way. All right, Chris, we're out of time, but thanks very much for coming to the Cube. Hey, it's, thank it's you. Great to have you. Thanks for sharing your insights. Okay, Pleasure. keep it right there, everybody. This is the Cube. We're live at Red Hat Summit in Boston. We'll be right back after this short break. Keep it right there.